You guys probably have never heard about me. Um, I am a professional mountaineer. That is my job. Uh, I'm a professional mountain guide. Uh, and I climb and ski some of the big mountains in the world. And I've got about 35, 40-ish minutes to explain some of the crucial learning points from my, my career as a high altitude leader. I'm most well known for climbing this mountain here. This is Mount Everest. And uh, in my little keynote today, I'm going to take you on a journey, a journey to the top of that mountain. But along the way, I want to try to distill to you what leadership and key critical decision making looks like to me and why it looks like that. Now, I, I am an unfamiliar face, uh, unfamiliar voice, as, uh, as Sarah said. So a very quick introduction. I was born in London. In fact, I was born in Slough. And uh, last time I looked in Slough, there were no mountains. My career has been built upon really nothing other than hard work and diligence, which I think is a very crucial thing. Uh, one of those things which often is forgotten about these days. We expect often a meteoric rise to various positions. But that simply doesn't work in the mountains. You have to do hard work and, and diligence gets you there. And I am now considered one of the premier high altitude guides in the world, which seeing that I grew up next to the Mars Bar factory in Slough, I actually think is quite a, a, uh, a world, um, worthy achievement. But um, we are talking about the mountains today and, and leadership. And for me, leadership boils down to a, a very simply a few things. It's, it's a relationship building process and it's a cultural thing. If you can build those into the team. I, I build relationships with my clients. I don't climb Everest for giggles. I professionally lead people to the top of that mountain. I always have done. Uh, be it unknowns that you'll never hear of, or even people like Sir Randolph Fiennes, the world's greatest living explorer, who employed my services over a five, six year period with the express idea of trying to get him to the top of the mountain. And what I do, I try to build those relationships. And then with the, the cultural side of things, I bring in people from other religions, other countries, my Sherpa team. They're, they've got a completely different way of thinking. I've got to bring it all together and somehow mold it into a functional, high-performing team. Now, one of, the, one of the very obvious things about that is a clear vision. And in mountaineering, we often think, well, you know, what, is, what is the goal of mountaineering? Well, very simply, it's getting to the top of the mountain. It is an obvious one. There can be no clearer objective in anything we do. But is it? Because for me, it's not. An objective of mountaineering is, is to come home. First and foremost, come home safe and sound with 10 fingers, 10 toes, and a nose. You don't lose those bits to frostbite. Come home as friends having had a really good time. And thirdly, and it is quite a distant third, is to gain the top of the mountain. Now, if the team don't understand what the vision and goal is, it's very hard to, get, to guide or to steer those individuals to their end goal. If one of my clients is so focused on climbing the mountain and nothing else, it's almost impossible for myself or the other members of the team to make the right decisions at the right time. So it's super important to have that clear vision. I instill into my clients, success represents the journey, not the destination. And once they understand that, once I can build that into the relationship, then my job as a high altitude leader becomes so much, so much simpler. And the team is very diverse. I, I, my, my backroom team, for instance, are, are these guys, the Sherpas, the, the backbone of the Himalayas. This is Dorji Gelgin, my high altitude climbing Sirdar, my right hand man. And the guy in the background who's always in the background is Kami. He's my logisticals guy. I've worked. I've worked with this team for nearly 12 years. They're one of the best out there. I spent a long time securing their, their services. Dorji last year said he didn't want to return to Everest. He had uh, had enough of his friends dying on the mountain, the earthquake, the avalanche, which killed a number of his friends in 2014. I had to somehow coax him back into the team. He is, I think, indispensable. And the way I coaxed him back was not throwing money at the situation, because that's just rude. And it's asking him to do something he's uncomfortable with, something which ultimately could kill him. So to give him money is nothing short of blood money. 
Now, the reason I got Dorji back into the fold is because of the years of working with him, the building the trust. I've climbed with Dorji. I've got eight or nine summits of Everest. We stood shoulder to shoulder. I've, I've laughed with him. I've cried with him. I've sweated with him. I carried huge loads up and down that mountain. I've celebrated with him. Building that culture within the team so that when I do bring my clients in, into Everest Base Camp and to the Himalayas. There's already a very good understanding about what the culture looks like. It's a winning culture. It's one of confidence and it's one of experience. Now, Mount Everest is a huge project. Uh, it takes often six or seven weeks, unless you decide that you want to employ my services, in which case I have a slightly different outlook on how you uh, approach the mountain, a slightly slicker, uh, more streamlined version. This year, uh, I climbed uh, Mount Everest with a, um, a, a VC company owner whose active offices are just up the road from here. And we did a turnaround in four weeks, two days, the quickest ever commercial Himalayan Everest expedition. And it's not through cutting corners, it's through effective leadership. It's knowing when to call the shots, why to call, why to call the shots, and then how to execute it. As I say, it's a huge project. This is what Everest Base Camp looks like. It's nothing more than a rubble of stones on a moving glacier. I was putting this little presentation together, did some quick sums. I spent three years of my life in that tent, that dome tent. I don't know if that's something to boast about or something that's a little bit sad, but it all happens from that one tent and you uh, import everything you need there. Now, the first obstacle of many on Mount Everest is that thing behind you. Everything we do in life is full of obstacles. And what we can do as climbers or as individuals, we can want, run away from the challenge or we can embrace the challenge. By the time I get to Everest, my clients know exactly what the potential pitfalls are. And one of the bigger ones is this. And we somehow have to find a very convoluted way through it. It's incredibly dangerous. I mean, we've come up it a couple of times now and it, it always instills a huge amount of respect for me. It, it, it talks to you. It lets you know what it's going to do into a certain extent. And it can implode underneath you. It can drop on you from above or, you know, God forbid, you can fall into its inner depths, you know, never to be seen again. It's, how do you describe the ice for? It's undescribable in a way. It's, it's unique. There's nothing like it in the Alps. I've not experienced anything like it in the, in the Himalayas, or not on this scale. It's, it's unique to Everest. Ooh, a new triple set of ladders. Yeah, one of the biggest ones we've uh, come across. Oh, I don't like the ladders. Never have liked the ladders. I hope it's a steady one. Can't find the bloody ooh dear. Oh, that looks safe, doesn't it? Oh my word, it's enormous. At least the ladder's fairly well positioned. Oh, nasty, nasty. Oh, well, oh my word. Didn't like that at all. You know, we don't just step out the door and take risks willy-nilly. Everything we do is calculated. Oh. And despite that this is, what, my ninth straight year here, so I must have crossed these ladders dozens and dozens of times, I still don't like them. I still don't feel comfortable with them. You, you, you get on them and you're holding these little bits of rope and you're... And your feet and your crampon feet are tinking across the rungs. And you look down and some of these things are just bottomless. Absolutely bottomless. And oof, for me, I, I, I've never felt comfortable with them in, in all the time I've been here. Nothing you can do to take away the danger. It is a dangerous thing. The chips are now so down that even the slightest of errors compounds very quickly. And if we just think about it for a minute, there is no rescue at 8,000 meters. 
You can't call in a helicopter to come and whisk you off the mountainside because helicopters can't effectively fly that high. Where else in the planet is there no rescue? Because you could be on the polar ice caps and you can get a twin otter in. Maybe in the deepest, darkest cave, there's no rescue. But that's about it. You are very much out on a limb. You may also hear about crowds on Everest. Well, crowds on Everest comes down to one thing, poor management and bad decision making. One thing I always try to, in, 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 it's so important to make your own decisions. This photograph was taken three or four days after a picture was released on Everest of a huge queue of people. A huge queue of people where four individuals died that day because they spent over three hours waiting at the Hillary step, which is pretty much in the center of the picture. And the reason why people rushed is because they didn't have the patience. They were waiting for that weather window, which finally came, and all the teams up sticked and left, and thought that if they all climbed together, there'd be safety in numbers. But there never is safety in numbers. Make your own decisions. Don't look around you and let others influence you. Logical decisions. Look at what's in front of you. Look at the real time information and base your decisions upon your experience and what you are seeing at the time. That's all you can do. That's all you can do in the mountains. Now, getting to the top of, uh, of the mountain, is, it, it really does take your breath away. Now, we've talked about it a little bit already. Um, deadlines. Deadlines in, in, in the big mountains are absolutely critical, and it's a bugbear of mine. We have a one o'clock turnaround on Everest, came into being after the 96 disaster. What people don't always realize, we leave about 10 o'clock at night, climb right through the night, looking to summit about seven, eight o'clock in the morning, giving enough daylight, giving enough time, and hopefully enough oxygen reserves to get back down the mountain. The mistakes always generally occur on the way down. People lose focus, they make mistakes. One o'clock deadline, it's a deadline. In my industry, it's, 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 it's the reason why it's called deadline, if you get it wrong, somebody dies, pretty simply put. Now I work more and more in the corporate world and it seems to me that a deadline is one of these quite wishy-washy things that exists. They put a deadline in place. Oh, I'll just extend it a little bit. No, ladies and gentlemen, a deadline is there for a reason. People rely on deadlines, and certainly in the mountains, you don't miss a deadline. It's called a deadline because people die in the death zone if you miss them. One o'clock turnaround time. And again, that's instilled in the team. Everybody knows what it is. Everybody knows when it's going to occur. Now, once you get to the top of the mountain, 8,850 meters above sea level, let's just put it very quickly into context, that's where airliners fly. That's how high it is. Once you get there, you're only halfway there. You've got to get back down. A famous American mountaineer, a good friend of mine, Ed Vistas, once famously said, getting to the top is optional, but getting back down is mandatory. And that's where the mistakes start to creep in. People are tired. They fulfill their ambition and dream. They take their eye off the ball. Complacency has no place in mountaineering. Complacency has no place in business. As soon as it starts to creep in, People start making mistakes. You become mediocre in what you're doing. And even the term mediocre, it doesn't sit well with me. You've got to be sharp all the time. Challenge yourselves constantly. I showed you the picture of the summit ridge. There is no margin for error. Complacency is a killer at 8,000 meters. It has no place in the team. And my team all know that. But then you do finally get to the top. And I've just got a little teaser of what it's like. 